Hi everyone, this is your chess puzzler and welcome of course to the channel. I promised a lot of things, but it seems time is the biggest scarcity. Many games can be spectacular when those engines do their magic, but when it comes to the old classic games, okay, not as good as the engines are, but some people may want to disagree. Any game when there is a major piece sacrifice is by definition spectacular and there are many players who had the guts to go on and hand over their own lady to get the job done. One such person was this guy here, Paul Morphy. And this is not just about Paul Morphy himself but the opening he went for. The game was played between Morphy and John William Shulton in New York back in 15... <laughs> I beg your pardon, back in 1857. You ready for this one? Paul loved his E4 openings because there are fast and open up spaces for those pieces to come out and take control much faster than any other line of play. When Morphy was playing, he took control of the game against everyone. The opening he went for was named after him, in fact. So what a better player to show us how to do it. Morphy White went for E4. Duh. And now through these subtle moves, Morphy loved his Evan Gambits as much as he loved his King Gambits. He played both openings so often, he didn't even need to start up with a full set. And later on in life, he took an opponent starting without his Queenside Knight or Rook. After this Italian startup, Morphy went for the Evans Gambit, which is now a rarity. When was it last time you saw this one coming up? The idea of b4 is to deflect the bishop, and you can either take or just back off. Normally the bishop takes, and in this game, Shilton did just that. After c3, the bishop returned to c5, and many people here do go right for the centre. Not in this case, and Morphy did not rush things, even though this was going to come. Morphy was a perfectionist. He went for extremely simple games, but when it came to complications, he was the one to watch out. He waited until the opportune moment. Morphy on this move went on and castled. After d6, here came that attack on the bishop, and after the exchange here, it was time for this bishop to step back. And here, there are at least three different opening variations and opening names for each one move chosen by either side. But let's do this one step at a time. Often you get to hear about the Morphe attack in the Evans Gambit, and if you didn't, well I guess you will learn it. When? Here and now. And what a better time to grab this opportunity. This knight move to c3 is the so-called Morphe attack, and you don't even need to be a genius to know that since this is Morphe's own speciality, this is also the move he went for. Other moves also exist here. For example, a straightforward push to d5 to get the knight moving. But let's forget about this d5 thrust for now because if black moves this knight to attack the bishop, this opening is known as the Goering attack, named after whom? Karl Theodor Goering, a very well-known and strong German player in his time. And what did Shilton go for? Nope, it wasn't a knight move, but something else. Getting the king's sight knight out is very playable, but Shilton wanted to be a bit more advantageous here. He pinned the knight when this bishop landed on g4. And the entire purpose of this move is to be able to grab d4. And since one person who knows all too well about pins is Morphy, he went on and enforced the pin on the knight. The bishop removed the knight and Morphy was a bit forced to take by having to open up his king's side 
just not to allow Shilton to remove d4. Shilton responded with a very poor move. Any ideas? I think, and what am I saying? I know this move was very badly executed. Okay, let me reveal. King to f8. And if you are up against Mr. Morphy, he will punish you. This bishop move covered the problem on d4. And now pronto, the knight retreats, just to probably save him from doubling up. Morphy here went for a king move, just to be able to get the rook active. When this bishop was attacked, his return to a4 led to d5, and now things were about to open up. Morphy went for a rook move, but we were not looking at this rook on the king's side, but this rook. I thought I was hallucinating for a minute. But anyways, let's continue. After this rook moved to b8, and this queen moved to d3, am I lucky I don't have to explain them because I don't know. Shilton backed off his bishop, and now when the rook lined up on g1, things were beginning to heat up. Knight g6 came out of the blue, because it allowed e5, and now this bishop on c7 is as good as offside. And out of the blue again, black goes for this very sudden and very threatening queen move. When you see a move such as this one, you can't help thinking this queen needs to move out, even though she poses no immediate danger. I guess it's intuitive. No one wants the queen lurking in your own neighborhood. Point. Shilton may even consider sacking a piece just to be able to free up this bishop on c7. And in the hope, he can find a way to mate the white king. Just like any other player would do. Morphy too. When, after this big lady, a direct attack on the queen by this rook is for sure one way of doing things. But when the queen gets into h3, things may turn nasty. When this knight finds his way into h4, Morphy went for the queen using the bishop. And again, and for sure, he was looking to entice Shilton to take f2. So, can we go for this little guy in f2 or not? Well, this is like jumping off a plane without a parachute. Because when the rook attacks the queen, there goes the queen. So now that we know taking f2 is not just full of poison, but just a bit more than that. The queen sneaked into h3, and if ever she's threatened, she always has this diagonal as an escape path, correct? Morphy didn't mind having the queen on h3, because he could have asked the rook to send her back to where she came from. He rather got the knights rolling toward the king's side. Do you remember what we said? about Black wanted to give up a piece to free up the way for his bishop. Well, this was the time Shilton chose to do this. He attacked the bishop, and Morphy could not really take with his pawn because there is a mate on h2. So how did he do it? He said stuff the bishop and went on to attack the queen. And did so using his knights. Even though I think getting the rook to do this would have been slightly better. No need to say the knights were traded in, and since Shilton was warming up to the occasion that he might have just busted Morphy, he went full throttle after this bishop. This didn't even bother Morphy because, before anything is considered, once you come in with a check, you do need to deal with it. So the party started with this queen move to a3. And when the king moved back to e8, can you step in and take over from Morphy? We are going to use our normal two seconds with the option of pausing, of course. So, here we go. Two. One. And pause. This has to be execution a la Morphy style. 
Has anyone found this? Rook takes b7. And once the rook captured, this bishop came in with a check and that rook was going to be recovered. But when the king moved into f7, Morphy said, hold on, I'm not even going to take this rook. And he didn't. He removed d5 with yet another check. And now when the king slotted into this very narrow g6, it was time for the queen to stamp in. Anyone normal, and I say this because Morphy <laughs> was not normal, would take the rock and never blink. Morphy had a different idea in mind. Once his bishop on d5 protects the very weak f3, the queen on h3 is out of the game. For this reason, the queen abandoned her spot from h3, and by returning to d7, this bishop was now under threat. It was here where the bishop arrested the rook, and now with this bishop retreat, the bishop on b7 is now exposed. A bishop check on e4 looks perfect from where I stand, but Morphy went on and removed f6. The bishop had to capture f6, and this is what Shelton went for. With the bishop threat on f4, again, many people will be considering getting him out of here, but since the bishop on b7 is also under attack, Morphy repositioned him, and by placing him on e4, a move that came in with a check. Not only the king was squeezed into the high heavens, but he seems to be, he seems to have only one escape path. In short, the king was being bombarded from the front and the rear. When the king moved into the only legal square he could, the bishop retreated, and now through this h6 push, could Shulton escape? Rook g3 looks very final. And this, in fact, was the move Morphy went for. Shulton attacked Morphy's lady. But did this matter to him? I didn't think so because Morphy has triggered a very beautiful mate pattern. And this is how he did it. But before we wrap things up, do you want to have a go at it? Please pause if you don't want to see the final execution. Okie dokie, here we are. With the queen guarding h3, there is no way white can mate. Or is there? If you look at this position, white mates whatever move he opts for. First of all, you can take the bishop for starters. And if you take the queen, once the queen deflects from the white diagonals, the rook can step in and boom, we're there. Now hold on, where are my special sound effects here when I need them? Can we um, sound them please? Thanks. If you now come in with this queen check, just for the fun of it, a king move to h4 is going to get the queen arrested, and from here, it's just a matter of half a move. Morphy here went for the third option. He came in with a check, and once the queen took, there came the rook to save the day. This game, in fact, qualifies as a queen sacrifice, but Morphy didn't really care what piece came off. There is hardly any game where he didn't hand over one or more major pieces to see him through in the end. And this is one of so many examples on record where he established a mate pattern, but once again, without really needing the lady to do it. Okay, I hope you enjoyed because you shall be seeing more of Paul Morphy because he was the best engine of his time. And just look at how beautifully he executes every single move, time and time again, until his rivals fall. Plenty of more to come, of course. So until then, this was your chess puzzler.